On January 20, 2020, Korea reported its first COVID-19 infection. It's been two years since then, and the battle continues amid the emergence of Omicron that is rendering our current containment efforts less effective. For more, I have Professor Kim Moon-gyu from Yonsei University. Welcome back, Professor Kim. Thank you for having me. I also have Professor David Kwok from Sun Cheng University. It's a pleasure to see you again. Good afternoon. And joining our session virtually is Professor Ali Mokdad at the University of Washington over the U.S. Professor Mokdad, it's been a while. Welcome back. Thank you. Professor Kim, we'll start here then. Korea has endured four waves of the pandemic over the course of two years. And now Omicron is looking to fuel a fresh wave. How do you assess the risks we face? Well, uh, there's no perfect quarantine system in the world. And, uh, but if we look back on our experiences, I would like to give praise that uh, what we have achieved. <clears throat> there are some shortcomings which uh, should be corrected and uh, like a uh, delay in vaccine supply and what kind of vaccine we uh, secured and uh, uh, we were not so good in early monitoring uh, about the neighboring countries especially China uh, and if we compare with Taiwan uh, they did a very excellent job to uh, prepare for any kind of uh, outbreak be even before WHO announced so I think we are entering a totally new phase of uh, pandemic or endemic and uh, in which the uh, Paxlovid might play a uh, big role and uh, I think the risk we have to consider is the uh, overwhelming of uh, health facilities like ICUs so we should have to prepare more and uh, uh, if we change uh, our strategy, there might be some confusions in uh, s uh, the people and in the uh, medical professionals. So I think uh, we need a lot of efforts to inform this new uh, strategy. To the people then yeah. as well. Professor Mokdad, speaking to U.S. media outlets in recent weeks, you predicted Omicron will peak this week over in the U.S. Now do tell us more about your prediction and perhaps its accuracy given the status quo there right now. Yes, we predicted a while back that uh, Omicron will surge on uh, January 17th, and that's what has happened in the United States. Cases are coming down, have, have been coming down for the past two days. Even hospitalization, uh, the United States started to come down as well. There are variations within the United States. Some states are still have not peaked yet. Uh, California, for example, will peak in four days. But in general, in the U.S., uh, cases are coming down, and we're heading into a better uh, days ahead of us. Right. And Professor Kwok, back here on the local front, when do you suppose will Omicron become the dominant strain here? Well, it's, it'll be a very much of a rough guess that I'm about to make today. Uh, it's only because uh, it really it depends on a different country and different um, atmosphere how physically transmissible this new Omicron, which is already known to be much more trans transmissible than other variants, uh, to actually uh, progress I inside the country. So I think I'm thinking of multiples of factors that are going to affect this. Uh, number one is the fact that as opposed to other countries such as the US, US or the UK, we have recently been rising in the rates of booster shots. So we have reached so far about 46% or so, but we're still currently um, giving them to the elderly and uh, the, the people who need them. Uh, so as opposed to the UK and the US who have received booster shots a long way before, I think we'll be much better protected from the booster shots itself fighting against the Omicron. So that's one factor that I'm currently thinking of. The other factor is the fact that we're much more densely populated than the westernized countries. So uh, when it actually happens, we also have a chance that Omicron could shoot up even much faster than the other countries that we've observed. Uh, and also, we, ha we tend to um, comply better than these uh, aforementioned countries in, in the sense that we wear our masks much better. We keep our social distancing on the inside much better. So multiples of factors will come into place when the Omicron starts hitting us. I, I don't think we are actually in the zone to start shooting up uh, yet, just yet, because we have barely reached about 50-something percent in the southwestern part of the country. Uh, once it starts shooting up, though, I, I don't think it'll take more than a couple weeks 
uh, to reach its peak, and I speculate that it's going to happen roughly in about three to four weeks, uh, uh, thinking that uh, we haven't completely gotten into the zone to start shooting up yet. So I think that must t take about a week to a couple of weeks, and then it'll also take a week to two weeks for the, 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 the total shoot up, and hopefully we'll go down from there. Right. And Professor Mokdad, based on your forecasting model then, what can you tell us about perhaps the timing of Omicron's peak here in Korea? So what, in our projections, uh, Korea will peak on February 18th, so one month from now. And uh, cases will peak at about 140,000 cases uh, at that day. And then, but however, in Korea, as my colleague just mentioned, you have higher vaccination rate, you do much better in terms of uh, mask wearing and social distancing. We're not ex expecting as much mortality in Korea. The virus itself is less severe than what we have seen before. And, and our estimates right now, the peak of mortality will be on March 3rd in Korea, about 20 deaths a day when it peaks. So less mortality. However, I agree with my colleague, there'll be a lot of hospitalization and the pressure on hospitals and the peak on hospitalization is expected to be on the 26 uh, in our models and around 38,000 will be in hospitals not admission total people who are in hostels at that time. We're seeing in the United States uh, that even in New York City, where it's a very dense population, it came up fast, as my colleague said, and it came down as fast as it, it's coming down as fast as it went up. But also we didn't see as much pressure on hospitals in New York City when it came to ICU and intubation. We've seen people coming to the hospital, but less people of those who came to the hospital needed ICU and intubation. But the sheer number of people who came to the hospital overwhelmed our hospital. Right, I see. Now, Professor Kim, so Professor Mokta believes that our cases of Omicron will peak mid-February. And if that is the case, health authorities here have spoken about an Omicron-tailored response strategy. Now, how does this particular containment effort compare to our current framework of prevention guidelines? Something will be the same, but uh, uh, something very different, uh, important, is that <coughs> we used to focus on the total count of the patient. It's going to shift to uh, a focus on a more severely ill patients. And uh, so that's the reason we need more ICU beds and it's in process right now. Now we have more modality to fight against COVID-19, which is the medicine named Paxlovid and uh, others. Patients with mild symptoms may stay home and they may take this medication if needed, if indicated. And so medical facilities may more focus on the high risk and highly ill patients. Uh, usually they have some under underlying conditions. And private small clinics can join in prescribing this medication and they contribute more uh, for this pandemic. Uh, since last month, the portion of foreign visitors uh, increased up to 14%, uh, which is a higher portion. And uh, they uh, only small portion got a third uh, shot. So uh, uh, we need a strict quarantine measures uh, for these people and uh, uh, areas uh, exposed to these travelers or foreign workers might need a special uh, monitoring system. Uh, Korea has turned into a tide of increasing uh, pattern since last week. It is getting obvious that age more than 60 is decreasing and the younger portion is increasing. And the uh, vaccine program is still going on, uh, which is the main strategy against uh, Omicron. So uh, unvaccinated people more than 12 years of age is only 7.6% right now, but they occupy almost half of the uh, mortalities and the severely ill patients. So that means uh, vaccine is still the main strategy to fight, fight against uh, this uh, uh, Omicron. And uh, there might be many reasons they are not getting vaccinated. But uh, uh, if you are not vaccinated, you need more special care about yourself, wearing mask, keeping distancing, and hand washing. Right. Professor Mokta, you've pointed out that the Omicron decline over in the U.S. will be just as rapid as it's spread right now. When exactly do you expect Omicron to subside nationwide across, that is, in the U.S.? In March, in the United States, we'll have little cases. 
little admissions to hospitals. So we have a tough month ahead of us, all of us, including you in Korea. You have a couple of months because you're one month behind us in the United States. So a couple of months that are difficult. Same here in the US, we have one month ahead of us that's very difficult. And after that, we should be in good position. And our strategy during the surge of Omicron has been here in the United States, uh, unannounced, but it has been mainly focusing on uh, limiting disruption to our normal operations, basically keeping our hospitals running, keeping our essential workers and keeping food on our tables, our supply chain. Uh, countries who have tried to stop the infections didn't have as much luck simply because uh, it's highly infectious virus, as my colleagues are saying, and it's spreading so fast and even infecting people who are vaccinated. And the problem with Omicron, 80 to 90 percent of the infections right now that we are seeing uh, are asymptomatic. So you have a lot of people who are out and about infecting others not knowing because they're vaccinated and boosted and they are infected without symptoms and they're spreading the virus. Right. Professor Kwak, a number of health pundits claim the pandemic will become endemic this year. What are the implications of this transition? Well, first thing, obviously, we are going to seek to go back to the normal life that we used to have before the pandemic. I anticipate that it'll be very like, uh, uh, very much like uh, what we used to have with influenza virus. Um, so when a person shows up with certain symptoms that uh, indicates that that person might have a certain type of virus, especially with uh, influenza, we used to have the patient inside the hospital and be checked through antigen tests. And if that, that person tests positive, or if that person if test, uh, tests negative, but is still uh, suspected to have influenza, then we go ahead to give um, uh, the, the Tamiflu. I think when, when the uh, SARS-CoV-2 becomes an endemic, uh, it means that it'll no longer be as dangerous to the whole population as it, as it was going through the pandemic. So it, it'll have become much more manageable, meaning that I don't think there will be the need for as strict of a test measure such as a PCR test to test everyone who came into contact with the person of a symptom, also to make sure the person either has the virus or not, but rather I think it'll be much more symptom-based that we start treating people uh, with medications such as Paxlovid or Molnupiravir. But also the fact, I think for the time being though, at least for a while, we'll still continue to have somewhat of a social distancing level because I feel that people will remain still scared of the virus, uh, whether or not it's going to happen again. So I think at least for the first half or maybe going into the, even the second half of the year, despite countries not mandating such a strict social distancing, I think there will be plenty of people who will be still wearing the mask and still, still being careful for themselves not to have the virus. But as gradually time passes, I think it being endemic will mean that we will have it much more like uh, any other viruses that we commonly have in the daily lives. Right, and if that is the case, Professor Kim, should Korea be looking to alter its containment strategy in preparation for COVID-19's transition into an endemic state? Yes, uh, all of us is going to get immunity on, against COVID-19 either by vaccinated or by natural infection. And if it's that the case, I mean in the near future, but if it's that the case, this coronavirus is going to be a seasonal viral infection of young children who are not born yet. And uh, I, I, people ask me, uh, when is this COVID-19 going to finish? And I say soon, because uh, we're going to have another one called Omicron. And uh, the elderly high-risk group needs a... Uh, very uh, 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 care, cautious, and uh, because breakthrough infections and health authorities need to determine the timing for further vaccination or any preventive measures. So they have to wear masks for themselves and for others. Still, there are many blind spots in our world map and uh, we need to be vigilant for emerging new variants and uh, uh, especially in lower middle income countries. And even though many things will return to uh, pre-pandemic uh, periods, major hospitals may have to keep quarantine measures for a prolonged period of time because we don't want to spread it inside uh, our hospitals. So yeah, definitely I'm gonna wear a mask for uh, quite a long time.
I see. Professor Mokdad, under current circumstances, what are your prospects on the emergence of a deadly COVID-19 variant? So right now, uh, if you're watching what we are doing here at IHME, we came out today and we said uh, that Omicron will end the pandemic of COVID-19, but will not end COVID-19. And the days ahead, I agree with my colleagues, it will be endemic and it's like flu, we have to deal with it. We're getting better at dealing with Omicron for many reasons. As was mentioned today, uh, we're all exposed either through vaccine or infections. We have better uh, vaccines and we are designing better vaccines and mRNA allows us to modify the vaccine depending on the variant that's circulating as soon as possible, much faster than we used to do before mRNA with the flu vaccine. And we have also the antiviral medications that now are helping and they will reduce hospitalization and mortality. And of course, very important, we know right now, if we have a variant of COVID-19 coming up uh, that's severe, we know how to deal with it in terms of wearing a mask and keeping a social distance. In my opinion, the days ahead are going to be much better. We're going to have a difficult time, but we are moving into an endemic phase of the virus. And I agree, children who are not born are not exposed to COVID-19. We need to figure out a way to immunize them and get them the protection that they need. Of course. Professor Kwok, moving beyond Korean and U.S. borders, Chinese authorities claim Beijing's first case of Omicron may be the result of a contaminated parcel from Canada. What are your thoughts on this? Well, so I look, I dug a little deeper into the, the, the report and found that the reason they came up with such an idea is because they could not trace back any farther than to the origin, uh, origin of the Omicron variant that happened in, in, in China other than the fact that, that he or she actually opened the parcel from Canada. So there why uh, suggesting that it might have been uh, attached to the parcel or the surface of it. Uh, currently, the data shows that it's really not physically possible for a, a, a SARS-CoV-2 virus to stay that long in an uh, unlive uh, surface. So um, it, it may barely be able to stand about three, four days at maximum, but especially going through certain different processes a parcel has to go through, I think there's a very little chance a parcel going overseas can actually carry this virus. On the other hand, I think there's a great chance that we should still be observing quite well of livestock, especially the felines uh, that was studied to show as much of the transmission rate as humans in the beginning and phase of the pandemic. So if we were to be dealing with, let's say, livestock of I don't know, cows or cats, I think we should be still be observant that uh, they are not carrying any viruses uh, going um, overseas or uh, even domestic. So that's something that maybe we should uh, think about. Right, I see. And Professor Mokdad, hospitalizations reportedly among children in the U.S. have soared amid Omicron. What does this reality tell us about Omicron's potential impact on the young? So uh, Omicron in the United States came during our high season. So usually in the U.S. there is seasonality in admissions to hostel, which is in winter. So Omicron came during winter. And uh, we know children under the age of five in the United States and everywhere in the world are are not vaccinated right now because they're not eligible for the vaccine. And many of our children in the United States, especially under the age of two, have been very protected from COVID-19 through protective measures. So they've never been exposed to this virus. And all of this put together have led to a lot of infections for children. But still, the virus is not as severe as we have seen uh, the variant, as we have seen with previous variants. But still, it's leading to a lot of hospitalization for children and unfortunately to deaths among children under the age of five. And for children under the age of 18, we're seeing that pattern among people who are not vaccinated, unfortunately which is why vaccination is very important then. Professor Kim, preliminary findings over in Israel show a fourth COVID-19 vaccine shot, however, offers limited protection against Omicron. Now, having said that, what are your thoughts on the necessity of additional shots following a booster shot? I think that study is a uh, very early and preliminary report from Israel. And uh, I'm sure that they included elderly uh, uh, people. Uh, the, the fourth the fourth shot gave more, produced more antibody than the uh, third shot, but uh, the, this antibody is not that effective against uh, the spread of, to block the spread of Omicron. And uh, I think those elderly groups are the group who are uh, most uh, needed 
uh, I'm, I'm in danger uh, if they get infected. So I think we need the time to find an effective uh, vaccine against uh, Omicron if it's needed. And I guess the role of that medicine called Paxlovid and others, uh, they, we need that kind of uh, uh, medicine more. Right. Professor Mokdad, according to my colleagues who are earlier on, authorities over in the UK are planning to lift their COVID-19 prevention efforts, including the wearing of face masks and the need for vaccine passes to certain venues. What are your thoughts with regard to these measures? I agree with them. I think many countries will do so right now, especially those that have passed their peak and coming down. These measures, uh, they were difficult on society, they were difficult on the government, but they saved a lot of lives. But because Omicron is infecting a lot of people, and by the time Omicron passes, we're going to have a lot of people who are immune to the virus simply by vaccines. So we don't need these measures again. And even if we have another uh, variant that could be more severe than what we have seen what we are seeing right now still the fact that we have that immunity and that knowledge of this virus we will be able to handle it yeah i'm supportive of uh, reducing these measurements but again looking at case by case it's okay to do it in england it's not okay to do it yet in korea until you of course your search is down Right. And staying with such measures, Professor Mokdad, I believe you've also spoken about the need to save testing methods for those who are uh, healthcare workers or those who are uh, exhibiting or showing symptoms instead of using those testings on people who are asymptomatic or have mild symptoms. Could you explain your thought on that, please? Yes, here in the United States, we had a lot of pressure on testing and we, we were not prepared to do the amount of testing. And in the US, for example, we had at one point of time almost one million cases on a daily basis for a week. There is no way we could test everybody who's been exposed to those people or who have been uh, identified as a potential that we need to test. So what we needed to do here in order to make sure that our hospitals are running, that our staff could go back to work, I asked in the United States to, if you are asymptomatic, please don't test yourself and only go to test yourself if you need to make a decision based on the result of this test, so go back to work or not, and save those tests for those people who need them in order to keep our country running. And I would ask the same everywhere right now, because there is a lot of pressure on testing. We need to be responsible and we need to only say, uh, do the testing if we need it or if save it for somebody who really need it in order to keep the country running. Right, especially if there is, of course, a severe shortage in testing supplies in the nation. All right, Professor Mokda, thank you very much for your thoughts. Professor Kim here in the studio, thank you for being with us today. Thank and you. Professor Kwok, as always, thank you for your insights. Thank you.